Then there we go. So the title of the talk, as you can see, is the Via Antigua versus the Via Moderna approach to modal logic, the case of John Fabry of Valenciennes. And as I said, it, this is a talk that is based on joint work that I've been carrying out with Lawrence de May now since um, basically spring 2018. Now, because we're here today with people from many different backgrounds, um, classics, history of linguistics, history of philosophy, I will briefly start by explaining the setting in which John Fabrio Valenciennes was active. And that will involve um, a brief introduction to the Via Antiqua versus the Via Moderna. And then um, I will be talking about the case of John Fabrio Valenciennes and his modal logic um, in specific. So the Via Antiqua versus Via Moderna was a debate that took place in later medieval philosophy. And by that, I mean the period between roughly 1400 and 1530. Geographically, it was limited to Northwestern Europe. Um, so basically from Basel in the south to Northern Germany in the north, from uh, Paris until Poland, um, west and east. And it was a debate about philosophy, as I said, but more specifically um, about logic. And we do know that there were two um, groups of philosophers, logicians, who were competing against each other. They were called the Antiqui and the Moderni in the sources, the um, adherents of Via Antiqua, adherents of Via Moderna. Um, you can also call them the traditionalists and the modernists in English. We know that there was a debate, but we do not know exactly at this point what the debate was actually about. Um, you could say even that the Wegestreit, which is how the debate was often construed in the scholarship, was how often labeled in the scholarship, is one of the main um, unresolved issues in the history of medieval philosophy. So when you look at the uh, past scholarship, then you will probably um, see one of three interpretations three interpretations that you can uh, briefly see mentioned on the on the slide. So scholars often construe the debate between Antiqui and Moderni as an ontological debate. That is an, a debate on the status of universals, whiteness, um, blackness, and so on, where the Via Antiqua supposedly um, endorsed the realist interpretation and Via Moderna a nominalist interpretation. So on that account, the Via Antiqua versus Via Moderna debate actually reduces to an ontological debate, a debate that was moreover already fought out during the 12th century. So in that sense, later medieval philosophy, the Wegestreit, is basically a continuation of the debate that already took place in 12th century um, philosophy. People like Abelard, as you might know. Now there is a second um, interpretation, according to which the Wegestreit was at its very core, a debate on semantics. So a, a logical debate, actually, a proper logical debate. And mainly about which approach that we should take when we talk about semantics. And I uh, briefly mentioned the term supposition. Now, what supposition is about is not very important. But the important thing is that the Via Antiqua and Via Moderna took different approaches towards supposition. Via Antiqua said, well, you could use these tools maybe for some purposes within logic. Via Moderna said, no, you can use them for many more purposes. And that was the root of the debate, according to this second interpretation. According to the third interpretation, it's a debate about predication, different approaches to um, what it actually means for a term to be predicated of another term. So again, we're talking about logic, but there are some ties with ontology. Um, the realists, as they're often called, the traditionalist is a term that I personally prefer. Traditionalists are adherent, uh, adhere to what is often called the inherence theory of predication, according to which, for instance, in a proposition, Socrates is white. The term white signifies the universal whiteness. The term Socrates signifies the individual. Socrates, and then whiteness is said to inhere in Socrates, hence the inherent theory. And identity theory would then say that Socrates is white, means that 
the term Socrates denotes the entity Socrates, the term white denotes a set of entities that are white, and one of the entities that are white is the entity that is Socrates. That's an identity theory of predication. So in short, there are three um, very common interpretations of what the Wegestreit, the Via Antiqua, Via Moderna debate was actually about. But this account actually, all three accounts are actually lacking in explanatory power in the sense that when you look at the late medieval sources ranging from modal logic to topical logic to natural philosophy to ethics even, you can see that there are traces of this Wegestreit debate, but authors referencing the Antiqui say this or the Moderni say that. And it's often very difficult to relate these um, debates to issues in ontology, issues in semantics or a theory of predication. And so for that reason, I think that it's better to approach the Wegestreit as, as its very core being a problem of authority, namely which authors should we follow? Because if you look at the late medieval text, then you see that the Via Antiqua is actually um, based on the thought of Albert the Great, of Thomas Aquinas, of Duns Scotus, while the Via Moderna is based on others like Buridan, Ockham, Marsilius of Ingen. So essentially, when, for instance, an Antiqui, an Antiquist author would want to write something on modal logic or want to write something on ethics, and he's, he's um, facing a problem, then the first authors he will be looking at are Albert the Great, Aquinas, or Scotus, while the Modernus would look at Buridan, Ockham, and Marsilius of Ingen. So it's a doctrinal debate on, on uh, issues in philosophy as much as it is a sociological debate, you could say, or an, a debate on, on authority um, in general. So that I think is what the, is a more um, comprehensive approach to the um, Wegestreit, one that can account for the fact that traces of the Wegestreit are found in a great variety of texts, not only um, the texts that specifically relate to ontology, semantics, and predication, and so on. So that's the setting, the Via Antiqua versus the Via Moderna. Now, one of the core features of this debate was its institutionalization. And by that, I mean that universities and centers of learning in general, but universities, most of them, nearly all of them were universities, um, that they profiled themselves as standard bearers of either the Via Antiqua or the Via Moderna. So for instance, when you look at Via Moderna institutions, then you get places like Erfurt, Vienna, Rostock. When you look at Via Antiqua places, you get Cologne, for instance, St. Andrews, as well as Louvain. And Louvain will be the focus of the talk today. So basically the main takeaway is that Antiqui and Moderni were um, debating each other and Antiqui were associated with specific universities, Moderni were associated with other universities. One of the Via Antiqua um, universities, as I said, is Louvain or that's how Louvain is often portrayed in the scholarship. And previous scholars have um, tried to argue for this view by pointing at decrees that were um, promulgated by the arts faculty. And for instance, one of the decrees that is often cited is one from the year 4047. And there it is said that Aristotle's text should not be interpreted according to Wycliffe, Ockham, or their followers, but should be interpreted according to Averroes, Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas, or Giles of Rome. Now, the references to Wycliffe and Averroes are not super important here. What is important is that the text explicitly says that Ockham or his followers or other suspect expositors, and by these followers, scholars agree, are meant um, Buridan and Marsilius of Ingen, usually, um, that those interpreters or those commentators are actually prohibited. The commentators that are recommended are Albert the Great, Aquinas, or Gauss of Rome, which again, we see where the authorities that were suggested within the Via Antiqua or the, the Antiqui were usually, um, the authors that the Antiqui would usually go to. So based on these um, 
on texts like the 4047 degree, there is a consensus in the scholarship that Louvain was a via antiqua bastion. Um, and this consensus, it has been a consensus for more than a century. Um, so I give two quotes on the slide. One quote is from classical, um, one of the classic texts in the history of universities, Rajdal's study of universities in the Middle Ages. Um, and Rajdal writes that Louvain was a university where intolerant realism prevailed. Notice that Rajdal is speaking about realism rather than via Antiqua. Realism is the an ontological um, current. So this relates to the first interpretation that I briefly outlined at first, namely the interpretation that via Antiqua versus via Moderna is actually an ontological debate. That's the um, assumption that Rajdal is making. The second quote is from a more, much more recent source, namely the Cambridge History of Medieval Philosophy. And the quote says that nominalism had been overturned in Louvain, Cologne, and Central Europe and replaced by a doctrine of the universal that relies strongly on Albert the Great and that opposed not just Buridanism, but also Scotism. Notice again that the author, Biar, is assuming that the Wegestreit is just an ontological um, debate while this is um, questionable. Also, the reference to Scotism is, I think, um, wrong. But the main takeaway here is, again, the emphasis on Louvain as via Antiqua Bastion. Now, how does all this relate to lecture notes? Well, the view that Louvain was a via Antiqua Bastion has been um, challenged in more recent scholarship. And most of this scholarship, if not all of it, was based on the study of lecture notes, Louvain lecture notes on logic. So to date, we know of 12 um, logic manuscripts that contain lecture notes um, and that relate to Louvain University during the period 1425, which is when the university was founded until um, 1530. And you can see the list of manuscripts on the slide. Um, so there are 12 in total. They are preserved in libraries in Germany, um, in Switzerland, in France, in um, Scotland, also in Leuven. Um, one manuscript and in the Netherlands. The Leuven manuscript was the, the topic of Anne Smet's talk um, earlier today. Good, the focus of the remainder of this presentation will be on one of these manuscripts, namely the Saint-Omer manuscript 609, which was written around 1502 um, at one of the arts colleges at the University of Leuven. Um, by a student named Alardus Tassar, and it contains um, the written reflection of a logic course that was taught by a certain John Fabry of Valenciennes. Now, the manuscript is um, a set of paraphrases of Aristotle's logical works and then commentaries on these logical works. And these commentaries, in specific, they contain traces of via moderna logic. And to understand that, we should realize that the scholastic art of writing commentaries is very different from the present day or even the Renaissance notion of writing commentaries. Basically, what these texts are doing is when Aristotle um, introduces a new problem, then the commentator will address certain aspects of it and write essays or treatises on that specific topic, which are not necessarily related to what Aristotle is saying. And for that reason, it's often, um, well, the, the author will often rely on other sources to to develop his, to, to structure his thoughts on certain, on, the, on these problems. And that's why there's often, um, there are often very clear traces of, for instance, Albert the Great or Buridan or um, Occam and so on, the, the big names from 14th and 13th century philosophy and logic. And in the case of the 1502 manuscript, the manuscript um, preserved in Saint-Omer, most of these treatises, these exposés, um, show clear traces of via moderna logic, of Buridan, of Occam, and so on. Now, the author, John Fabrio Valenciennes, was a logic lecturer who was active around the turn of the 16th century, but we don't have uh, much biographical data. So we know that he studied in Louvain in the 1490s, that he started 
teaching around 1495 and that he continued teaching until at least 1505 although would probably continue lecturing later on but his name doesn't show up in these um, later sources mainly because the first um, two decades of the 16th century um, are not very well represented in the uh, in the surviving documents um, so we know that he was uh, that he served in several administrative functions in the arts faculty um, for instance he was treasurer to one of the naciones of the arts faculty he was dean um, he was quote libertarius as well and interesting is that he, he was the logic teacher of uh, Marte van Dorp Martinus Dorpius um, who was one of the most infamous logicians in Louvain around 1510-1520 so you could say that his student Marte van Dorp was more famous than um, the teacher but the interesting thing is that Marte van Dorp and this is something that Demi Verbeke has demonstrated. Marte van Dorp was also influenced by modernist logic, via moderna logic. And so there's there's a likely chance that he was partly inspired, at least by his teacher, um, John Fabry of Valencien. So more concretely, what Lorenz and I have been doing during the past two, three years is studying Fabry's modal logic, as set out in the commentaries on Aristotle's um, on interpretation and prior analytics. Now, I'm not going to go into details because, um, well, I don't think that will be very, very useful for, for you. But the, the main idea is that on many, many occasions, it's very clear that Fabry um, takes the same approach as authors who were writing in the Paris circle of John Mayer. Um, and that circle was one of the main, if not the main, uh, center of modernist logic in the area um, of the Low Countries and France during the um, first decades of the 16th century. So, for instance, well, I, I list a couple of, of topics on, on the slide. Inclusion of both eletic and epistemic terms. Um, the fact that composite modals, a category of modal propositions, um, can have quantified dicta, um, the fact that divided modals, another category of um, modal propositions, can be geometrized as an octagon, and the octagon you see here, I added it because the picture is nice. Um, those are typical features of a modal logic that you will find in modernist sources from the period, and that all go back to the work of John Buridan or people and people that worked in the entourage of John Buridan, like Mercilius of Ingen, Albert of Saxony, and so on. And so Lorenz and I wrote a book about um, Fabri's modal logic and the context in which Fabri was active, trying to link Fabri to the um, developments in, in Paris around the same period. It's currently under review, but we hope that it will be published in 2022, 2023, maybe. Um, so to wrap things up because I've been talking for 20 minutes. Um, the main takeaways from the talk are, well, you could say that there's one specific takeaway and one general takeaway. The specific takeaway is that the case of Fabri casts further doubt on the view that Louvain was a bastion of via antiqua logic, which as I said, was is the predominant view in the scholarship. Um, now the second takeaway is a more general takeaway. And that is the fact that student notes commentaries on um, Aristotle's works written down by students in a pedagogical context, that such sources, such texts are a very valuable source to shed new light on the big stories in intellectual history and the history of philosophy. As these stories are very often solely based on the study of printed sources and sources relating to the big names like uh, Erasmus, like uh, Ramus, like uh, Descartes. And for that reason, Many of the stories, I think, in the history of philosophy are um, incomplete or are very one-sided, to say the least. And I think that by focusing more on student notes, we could provide a new um, impetus, one could say, to the history of philosophy, to intellectual history, because you focus on secondary figures, like the mainstream thinkers from the period, and they are at least as important as the, the big thinkers from, from the area. 
because then it they they constitute the background against which you should understand the big thinkers like in Erasmus, Ramus, and Descartes, and so on. And they are they are very valuable. Um, these are very valuable texts, but they haven't been studied in in much um, detail in past scholarship. Okay, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, then I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, for this elucidating talk. I very much liked your conclusion that students can rewrite intellectual history, so to say. I see that we have already one question by Anne Blair. Please, Anne. Thanks so much. Uh, this is great stuff. I'm curious about the branding of universities and who is responsible for deciding that what camp the university is in. And is this a case of the individual professor not getting with the brand? Or is it more a case that, like I saw with Jean-Cécile Frey, who calls himself an Aristotelian, but in practice, he's very willing to criticize Aristotle, but he wants that brand also for himself um, because, you know, that's how you get around and 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 get promoted and have a reputation. You don't want to be branded as the bad stuff, you know. And so I'm 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 wondering wh where exactly the gap is. It was between a communal decision to call Louvain uh, in this way, and this individual actually has different intellectual uh, genealogy, or is it within the person, you know, sort of having a gap between the self label and the practice. Um, I think is the communal interpretation. Um, for instance, in, in the case of, of Louvain, the choice to um, self-identify as a Via Antiqua institution is partly because Louvain was modeled after Cologne. Um, and Cologne, well, Cologne was founded in 1388, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Louvain is founded in 1425. And Cologne was around that time um, well, strongly traditionalist, even to the extent that there were debates among Thomists and Albertists about um, the right interpretation within the Via Antiqua. And so the, the influence of Cologne on the Louvain, um, well, institutionally, basically, on the organization of the university um, is very, very strong. And that's, I think, one of the, if not the main reason why Louvain self-identified as a Via Antiqua institution. But you see that towards the end of the 15th century, um, professors become more and more dissident in the mm -hmm. sense that there are, well, there are several cases in um, the administrative sources where professors are um, fined or even expelled because they have been teaching doctrines secundum via modernorum. Um, there are cases, well, Fabri is, is one case. So the, the text of Fabri is one case where you, you can see clear traces of via moderna logic, but there are several other cases. And so I think that the, the more valuable way to look at it is as a competition you could call it between the, the official doctrine and then dissident professors who do not necessarily adhere to this doctrine, um, rather than an internal personal um, struggle. I didn't find any traces of professors trying to um, self-identify as an antiquus, but then nonetheless adhering to moderna, um, via moderna doctrines. What you do find is that the sources are omitted so that a certain doctrine is being explained and attributed to aliqui or quidam instead of explicitly naming well this comes from Buridan or Occam and so on and I think that the Louvain practice is representative of Wegestreit logicians in um, in general um, for instance I know of a case in Cologne which uh, as I said was officially uh, via Antiqua institution where professors were also um, teaching modernist logic and then using the similar strategies as professors in, in Louvain. So um, attributing certain theories to quidam, aliqui. Um, so I think it's, it should be best understood as a communal, as a communal thing rather than an intrapersonal thing, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, I see that uh, there is a question uh, by Mattia Mantovani and then by Asaf Bentov. So, Mattia, please. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. I cannot quite see to read the book. Just a comment and a question. Just to, uh, I think at the end, I totally agree with you how you relate the student notes to the big names that we must focus on student notes to. I found also that if you work on the 17th century, as I do, you may also see that you can use students' notes to see the to understand the correct interpretation of a philosopher. So I had the impression from time to time that the way they were teaching Descartes in Leuven, they got the car better from time to time than Malbranche because they, they, in a way they were they stayed closer to the text. So even the relation between the two can be more dynamic. So we can really use it to try to I know, walk out the milieu uh, of all this of all this reception. So they can really be a precious document, even for interpreting the big guys, not only to complement the thing. And my minor question is, in the 17th century, while working on uh, the student notes on nature of philosophy, I noted that mostly the no innovative views were defended by professor at the College of Lille, and of uh, the Lille mostly, and of the hawk of the farm. Whereas the pigs seem to be extremely conservative. This was my impression. I mean, this is one century and a half after your, the text you are discussing and so forth. But I wanted to know your take on that, even because while I was speaking with Stephen Kuzeman, he was saying, you know, most, the man, most manuscripts that we have are from the pig college because it was uh, far away from the center of the city. Therefore, when the fire struck, in a way we preserve, we have more manuscript from that college. So that the picture that we might have of Leuven might reflect very contingent factors. And so this would be just a question whether you think there is such a trend in the different colleges and you're taking that on that in general. Thanks. Well, that's a very good question. Um, I think, first of all, that we should be very careful with trying to associate specific tendencies with specific colleges, at least for the 15th and 16th century, because, well, for a period of, of around 130 years, we only have 12 manuscripts. So it's, it's difficult to, well, to abstract a general tendency from just such a small data set. Um, but I do agree that the lily was, well, I do also think that the lily was the more progressive um, college already during the 15th and 16th century because well the, the debates are totally different of course uh, at that time it was about humanism versus scholasticism and currents within scholasticism via antiqua via moderna but if you look at the debate between humanism and scholasticism then well for instance erasmus uh, stayed at the lily um, there are indications that greek was being taught at the lily in the 1520s um, but correct me if i'm wrong um, even earlier. Amero was also associated with the Lily, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the, the new humanist um, learning was embraced at the Lily, and it was embraced there much more than it was at other colleges. And you can also see it in logic. For instance, the the first, the Editio Princeps of Agricola's De Invasione Dialectica, core text in humanist logic, was printed in Leuven, but the entire process was being um, managed, so to speak, by a couple of professors from the Lily. So they were one of the driving forces behind the publication of this new humanist text. So I do think that already during the 15th and 16th, well, late 15th, early 16th centuries, uh, Lily College was the more progressive of the Leuven colleges. Um, but whether it was the case also for the Via Antiqua versus Via Moderna issue that I, I don't know. And I don't think that we can um, derive such a conclusion from the, the, the sources that um, have been preserved precisely because there are so few of them. Um, if that's an answer to your question. Okay, I think we have a little bit time still for a, a small, uh, for a short question by uh, Asaf. Please. Thank you. Uh, a very short question. Thank you very much. That, that was fascinating. I have a short layman's question concerning the Via Moderna and uh, Via Antiqua and student notes. You, you mentioned uh, rebellious uh, uh, professors. Is it at all conceivable 
uh, to find say in, in Leuven, the, say, the 15th century, a rebellious student. Is it still conceivable to find student notes to uh, um, um, some listening to a say via antiqua uh, lecture with via moderna sympathies? Or are they really their master's voice when they're making their student notes? That is a good question. Um... Now, I think that in general, it's very difficult to make a distinction between personal notes that the student made, um, for instance, after going to class or while he was studying or, or, so, or something like that. Um, and what he wrote down during his courses or what is the or to, to which extent you can divide the manuscripts between a very subjective um, section that was written down by the student contains subjective um, reflections of the student on the, the, the material that he was um, that he was given and the material that he was given by the professor on the other hand so i i haven't identified any cases where you could really tell that a certain remark in the margin or something like that was a very subjective remark by a student and so i i don't i should look into it but i don't think that they that there are such cases of, of rebellious students um, but i should look into it so thank you for the suggestion <laughs>